happy Friday. Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine, we're very excited about all of you joining us here this week. What a week, another, another great week in the history of the world. Um, uh, well, it, we started voting, sort of. Uh, I think we have a multiple voting sites, but I'm not sure that's still in litigation. But we're very excited about it, and I'll talk a little bit about voting at the end. So on the, uh, the not-so-good news side is, uh, you know, we're doing okay in the county. Uh, we're not doing great. And if you have watching the news at all, you see the, you know, every night on the news, all these states are getting worse. All their case numbers are going up. There are very few states where the levels are kind of flat. We remain one of the few states where it's kind of flat. But just look around the country, look at what's going on, look what's going on in Europe. If we don't keep our acts together and keep vigorously uh, uh, approaching this, our numbers are going to go up. And they're beginning to creep up uh, even now. So for the first time in a long time, our reproductive number or our reproduction rate is over one. That's not good. That means the virus is back uh, to winning and we're losing the battle. Uh, our test positivity rate is still pretty low. It's uh, under 5%, but it's just barely up to under 5 and it's beginning to creep up. And then once again, the number of new cases is shooting up. We were sort of in the three to 400 range and suddenly we're back close to 500 and 600. That's not good. Now, the only good news is kind of Harris County. Harris County has been doing a very, very good job. So we remain fairly low, but Montgomery County and Galveston, not so much. And I'm very concerned now that we're talking about opening bars. We have not opened schools. Why are we talking about opening bars? You know, that just makes no sense to me. We should stay the course. We're doing okay. Let's get our kids into school first. There is some good news on the school front. If you look at um, K through 6, nationally there have been very few outbreaks. There's been a couple of cases where kids got infected and a teacher got infected, most likely they were infected in their community and not in school. We do have problems with high schools. We've still had a couple of outbreaks in high schools, but it's not as bad as everyone anticipated. So I do think if we're really uh, rigorous around wearing masks and, so, and physical distancing, we should be able to get schools opened again fairly soon. But let's not rush into bars, you know, let's just not do that. That just doesn't make any, any sense at all. I thought today lots of stuff going on in clinical trials, so I wanted to catch you up on what's going on in clinical trials. As you know, uh, the J&J &J adenovirus vaccine uh, has been paused, waiting, uh, trying to figure out what that one complication was. The AstraZeneca adenovirus trial was uh, stopped because of two patients, and that still hasn't started in the United States. It's back going in, in the UK. Uh, the big uh, monoclonal antibody news is that Eli Lilly paused its phase two trial uh, because uh, uh, they were a little concerned about some complications. The good news, though, was in the 300 patients that did receive the Lilly uh, monoclonal antibody, uh, it was able to reduce hospitalizations from 6% to 1.7%. So that looks like a very promising approach using antibodies very early on makes a difference. Once you start generating your own antibodies, it looks like the monoclonals uh, aren't all that beneficial. Pfizer had big news. They're starting to do trials in adolescents. We, this has been a big missing piece of it. We've got to start vaccinating kids over the age of 12, and so that is uh, very, very good. If you think about it, a half a million kids have been infected this year, uh, and it's been in most of the deaths of, of children who've been infected have been in black and Latinx communities. So this is a very important uh, part of the trial that needs to be done. Uh, and Regeneron, the, 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 the antibody that was given to the president, uh, that looks like based on 275 patients so far that it reduces viral load and shortens the number of days you have symptoms from just about five days. So instead of being 12 days of symptoms, you're down to seven or eight uh, days. Now, the, the Regeneron has announced that they will distribute 300,000 doses of this as soon as it's available, but we don't know it is available. And none of this data I have just talked about is actually in peer-reviewed journals yet. So this sort of goes back to, you remember when we were talking about convalescent plasma? 
convalescent plasma is basically like giving antibodies. Now, it's not like a monoclonal antibody directed to a very specific domain. These monoclonals are directed to that spike protein. The kinds of antibodies you and I would generate from getting COVID infection are some antibodies to the spike protein, but antibodies to a lot of other parts of the virus. So it may not be as strong or as good. We were in the midst of clinical trials, but as soon as it was given over to you know, compassionate use, no one started signing up for trials, so we can't actually even determine whether convalescent plasma is useful, unfortunately. So we'll have to wait on the monoclonal uh, antibody trials. Now, I have gotten a zillion questions this week about uh, what did President Trump get? So I think I would help you understand what he got, besides everything. Uh, first of all, you know, he was on hydroxychloroquine at his own uh, decision to prevent the infection. Well, it didn't prevent the infection. So once he got it, uh, what did he get? Well, he got uh, the single dose of Regeneron antibody. Now, the Regeneron antibody is different from the Eli Lilly one. The Regeneron has two antibodies, but both directed at the same domain, or different domains of the same protein. Uh, he also got dexamethasone. That was sort of announced kind of during the course of his uh, illness, and that was a sign probably he was having problems with his oxygenation, and that's when he went to the hospital. He also received remdesivir, we've talked about that, that's the Gilead uh, product that is an adenosine analog that interferes with RNA polymerase, so it, it blocks the virus from replicating. Uh, and he, re he received some popular drugs, zinc, which people hypothesize might help the immune system. It's needed for immune uh, activation, but it's not required if you have enough zinc. Vitamin D, which is only helpful if you're vitamin D deficient. There's been no evidence that that's useful. Aspirin, low-dose aspirin, because there has been some evidence that clotting is increased, but again, no studies to prove that. Uh, pepsid, which is something that blocks uh, acid secretion in the gut, has been hypothesized to be beneficial, but no, no data whatsoever. And then, then of course, melatonin, uh, which, if you're taking all those kinds of drugs, you probably want to get some sleep, and that's, that's what it's for. Now, we are all glad that he did well. I mean, that's the, we're all happy he's, he's better, and that's great, and congratulations. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that this has sort of uh, re rekindled a lot of thinking, like, well, it ain't so bad. Why, why don't we just let everybody uh, get sick? Uh, that's not a good idea uh, for a lot of reasons. We don't know the long-term complications uh, of, of COVID infection. There have been some early studies in China and early on in both Italy and the U.S. that showed almost 8 or 10 percent of patients have some evidence of elevated enzymes that reflect damage in the heart. There was a study this past week uh, in the European Heart Journal that showed if you do autopsies on people who died, very high percentage of them have evidence of uh, heart damage, including myocarditis, right heart strain, and small vessel clotting. So these are not things you want to just take lightly. Even if you survive the disease, you, you might have serious uh, uh, complications going forward. And then there's been talk, of course, uh, stimulated by the president himself, that he's cured. Well, he's cured of that infection. Uh, but again, we don't want to be thinking about reinfection at this point. There have been increasing reports that you can get infected again, and there have been three reports of deaths from reinfection. So we're not sure if, if this cured or not. I mean, we all wish it was. The best thing that could happen would be you get infected, you're resistant, your, your, your immunity is up, you have antibodies to it, but we just don't know. So that's some part of it that we just really don't really know yet. Now, I've got a huge number of questions this week with the holiday season coming, and I, I can't help but help, <laughs> help you, help me figure out what to do. Right, there's no, we don't really know. Let's just say it's, it's, we're, we're all struggling with the same issues. Uh, I'll start off with the Rose Garden event, and the only reason to mention the Rose Garden event was, you know, we all were pretty comfortable with being outdoors. Well, the Rose Garden sh showed that even if you're outdoors, if you're close to people and you're not wearing a mask, it's probably not safe. And so that's important as we hang out with each other socially. Remember to maintain your physical distance. You can't be hugging people, going up to people, talking because you can transmit virus, at least based on the Rose Garden event, you can transmit it outside if you're close enough. So let's start off with Halloween. Now to me, Halloween's the easiest one. 
wear a mask. <laughs> You're already wearing a mask. Wear another mask. Wear two masks. Put five masks on. Uh, Go as, uh, as uh, Tony Fauci, or, or you call Donald Trump face with a, with a mask. That, that'll get a lot of laughs. So uh, go, wear, the, wear a mask. That's the most important thing. Don't have a bunch of families get together. The same exact rule. Go with your own family, you know, just the, your own family group. You've been in the same house together. Do it as a family. And then, you know, if your kids want to eat some, take some hand sanitizer along the way in case they want to actually eat some piece of candy. That way you can do that. Uh, wash your hands when you get home, and if you're handing out candy, I wouldn't have a big bucket and have all a bunch of kids sticking their hands in it. Think about leaving, you know, individual bags for them to pick up. But I think Halloween, since it's outdoors mainly, uh, should be pretty easy. Now, now comes the hard stuff. Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. What do you? What are we going to do around traditional family gatherings? I'd have to remind everybody that we're still in this. Nothing's changed. We are. Still the virus has not changed. We've learned a lot as a community, as a medical community. We fight it much better. We know how to keep people off ventilators. We have dexamethasone. We have remdesivir. Soon we'll have some of these other monoclonal antibodies and hopefully we'll have a vaccine. But the virus is the virus. It's not changed. So all the rules should remain the same, at least through this season. Uh, the main thing is limit your family gatherings. You know, just be your family unit. If you want to have like a kid or a parent together, then take some precautions. Why don't you quarantine for some like five or six days beforehand? You want to get tested? Get tested and then quarantine for four days. Then when you get together, at least you know everyone's, you know, negative as you go in. But you can't have large family gatherings. And remember, all the big outbreaks have been large family gatherings. There have been weddings, funerals, anniversaries, birthday parties. Let's not make Thanksgiving a giant super spreading event. We just, we just don't need to do that. You know, and remember, you can also do things like hang out outside more. You know, you, you can have dinners and gatherings outside. Uh, do as much as you can to maintain uh, physical distancing, uh, even in your family unit, if that's, if that's uh, okay. Now, a lot of questions have come up around flying, and I'm sort of moving in a different direction. You know, initially I told you I wouldn't get on an airplane because it's like a tube with a bunch of people in it, and it seemed very scary. But a few weeks ago, I went through the Boeing 737 data, and Boeing 737s are actually really interesting because they have a very direct airflow that goes from the top of the fuselage to the bottom, and then the airflow goes backwards, and it all goes through a HEPA filter, and they change over all the air, is outdoor air, every two to three minutes. So they're actually almost as good as what you do in an OR. I mean, it's really incredible. And, and we have not had a major outbreak on an airplane since bringing in masks. So, so I'm beginning to feel more comfortable about flying on a 737. I don't know the data for other airplanes and I'm trying to find that out and I'll let you know as soon as I get it. But for 737s, which is most of the fleet for, you know, m many of the mid sort of level uh, commutes between sm small cities, 737s are very common. So uh, most of them are, are, are used fairly often and some are the entire fleet like in Southwest, much of the fleet in United and American. Those planes seem to be good. I also had the opportunity to I have a conversation with the CEO of American Airlines last week or two weekends ago. And we talked about this and we talked about, you know, the number of infections of the flight attendants. We, we talked about the number of flight attendants and pilots and, who were infected and their incidence of infection is much less than the general population. Uh, and I asked him for the data for that. I'd actually like to see that and talk about it. Uh, he assured me that it's true, and based on that and the 737 data, I'm pretty comfortable flying on a 737 with a mask. Now, if, I, if and when I do that, I don't leave my seat. I try to get a window seat, and I put on a mask and, and wear glasses or goggles. And I think that that uh, should be pretty safe. So I'm not so much against flying personally anymore, uh, and I, so that's my recommendation to you. If you have to... Uh, I think it's uh, reasonable to do, especially around the holidays. I do want to sh do a couple of shout outs today. Uh, first of all and foremost for Ken Lau. 
Ken uh, is one of our outstanding uh, cardiovascular surgeons, and he just did his 100th robotic heart procedure. And we're going to show a video of that. It's, it's very cool. It's high tech and very important, and uh, he, he does a great job. And then the other thing I wanted to do is remind everybody that it is time to vote. Every one of you should vote. You see this little thing here? It says, I voted. Uh, I think everyone should vote, and a giant shout out to the Te Texas Medical Center. They created a, a polling place right in the main garage here with the, the restaurant and the, with the waterfall and all that kind of stuff where you can go by and vote. The main thing is go out and vote. So the, uh, you're going to see a video of, of, Dr. La of Dr. Lau. And by the way, I just wanted to show you that um, Lily, uh, not that she's political, but she wanted to make a statement that just don't vote for cats, whatever you do. No cats a lot. Do not vote for a cat. Anyway, so I will see you all next week. Have a great weekend. Great to see you. Nine-year-old Wesley Crew knew that he had mitral valve prolapse, meaning the two valve flaps of his mitral valve in his heart were not closing properly, which can cause the blood to leak backwards in the heart. As the symptoms worsened, he knew that he would need to have a surgical procedure to address the issue. However, when it was time for the procedure, he learned that Baylor College of Medicine surgeon Dr. Kenneth Liao could perform the procedure robotically. I've been doing robotic cardiac surgery since 2003. It's a very precise instrumentation, accuracy, and the enhanced visualization. The benefit to the patient is that smaller incision, less blood loss, quick recovery, and then better cosmetics. Mr. Crow was able to see the benefits from his procedure right away. I went home in three days. You know, and originally they thought it would take five, maybe seven. Dr. Liao recently reached a significant milestone since joining Baylor College of Medicine and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in 2019. We performed over 100 robotic um, uh, cardiac surgery already, and most of them are bypass surgeries and uh, my, mitral valve repair surgeries. Mr. Crow was Liao's 100th robotic surgery patient. My, my recommendation to anybody would be that if you have the option for robotic surgery, you certainly need to seize that opportunity. That the recovery will be much faster and you'll be much better off for it. I'm excited to do the best for the patient.